Today on the Leadership to Wealth podcast, we are doing part two of our interview with uh, Karel Gomez, and we get into really detailed specifics about how to go from being self-employed to a multi-million dollar business owner, how to build in each of these pieces, and we keep using the example of a plumber, how to put that wrench down and, uh, and really blow it out of the water. We ended off with talking about if you're the difference between being the business owner and being the plumber, right? Was putting the wrench down. Right. Right. Correct. Right. And so we were talking about how do you really get out of that mindset? How do you really make that shift? How do you really build and scale? Um, Because you were sharing with us how you would go out and get these contracts before even having uh, you know, the, uh, the staff in place or the agreements in place, but how did you come out of, out of that space? Do you remember that part of the conversation? Yeah, no, definitely. I do. Um, and, and, and like we said before we, we ended our, our first meeting, yeah. um, you know, as, as a business owner, you have to tell yourself, Hey, what do I want out of my business? Right. And we, we touched on this earlier on, on the prior call, um, you know, what do I want out of my business? Do I want my business to grow and become a large corporation with a lot of moving parts and, and, and really an established, um, you know, you know, mid size or, or even large size business, or do I want to just remain a simple, uh, operation that I can run myself and 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 manage myself without a lot of overhead and, and just be happy with that, right? So the, the business owner has to make that decision early on in their business. Where do I want to take my business? Do I want to take it to the as high as it'll go? Or am I okay here? You know, um and and so when you make that decision, then and, and if your decision is to grow the business. And, and I hope that most. Can I, can uh, I pause you for one second there, yes. Carol? So, if if someone's building a business, what what are the keys for them to even go? I, like, because if you were to say that, the business owner might go, "I don't know which way, which one should I do?" Right? Like, everybody just obviously, I should probably just try to build the biggest business, shouldn't I? What what would be the uh, what should someone take into account to decide? Do I build this way or do I build this way? I think the first um, point in deciding which way I want to go as a business owner is what do I want? uh, And and this is, I guess, a philosophical statement. You know, what do I want out of life, out of my financial life, out of my business life? Um, Do I want freedom for the family and for my friends and to do things? Or do I want to focus on business? Those are that's kind of the first question you got to ask yourself as a business owner. What do I want out of my my corporate life, the one I'm building, my business life? And and if and if it's to to grow a business and create it, make it a success where you're you're creating wealth for two, three, and four, even five generations beyond you, then the answer is I got to grow the business. If you are trying to run a business just for you and your significant other and your immediate family today with no real expectation of second, third and fourth generation beyond when you leave this earth, then you can have a simpler business. So the first question is, what am I trying to accomplish? Right. We talked about the goal on our first call. What is my goal? Is my goal generational wealth or is my goal to give myself the best life I can while I'm on this earth. For me, it's generational wealth, which means I'm not thinking of me only. I am thinking of my kids and their kids and so on and so on. Correct? And then what wealth I can create that is generational. And so once the business owner makes that decision, then they can decide, okay, if I want to create generational wealth, 
then I have to grow my business as big as possible. Or if I only want to have enough financial freedom for me uh, and, and while I'm on this earth, then I don't have to, ex you know, try to grow the business that big. So I think that's kind of the first step in deciding right, right. what I want to do with my business. How big do I want to make my business? So what I so what I'm hearing is if you want to the real distinction between the two is generational wealth, a business that will that will continue building and can continue going after you're gone versus one that is really built more around your life and your direct family. Like it obviously the wealth will be around, but it's not built to just carry on after you're gone. Exactly. Exactly. And that, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. So that is your your first question that you as a business owner right. must ask yourself. Do I want okay. generational wealth or build generational wealth or do I want it just for my time on this earth? And it's yeah. a very important question because that's going to give you the guidance and, and, and really tell you what is your goal? What is your goal? And so, um, Maybe you want a little bit of both and, and you want, I want to live, you know, the best life I can while I'm here and also create wealth. Well, that means that you're going to have to spend some years in the beginning only focused on the business. There is no way right. you're going to have a lot of freedom and create a business that has generational wealth capacity. So you have to understand that you're going to have to put the labor in to grow that, that business, right? And so then we go back to your original question was, how does the business owner put the wrench down or, or, or the paintbrush down, right? Yeah, how do we put how the we wrench put the down? Wrench That's down. the key. We want to put the yeah. wrench down. Okay. Once you've decided you want to create a general, you know, a generational wealth, then you know that your focus is no longer on the work, but on the business, or at least you must learn that. If you're going to create generational wealth or any business of a significant size, even if it's only one generation past you or a very successful business while you're here, then you must understand that in order to do that, you must focus on the business and you've got to put the ranks down. So you cannot focus on the work. You have to focus on the growth of the business as a business, as an entity. And that is when you realize that in order to focus on the business, you cannot focus on the work. Therefore, you must put that wrench down and, and put your energy and focus on the business itself. Right. So right. we got to so we put the wrench down. You got to focus on the growth of the business. Right. Right. Okay. And so got it. people often confuse the work and the operations with that being the business. No, no, no. Right. The operations and the work are part of the business. The business is the entity that is developed and built to generate wealth and opportunities for the operation to function. But the operation is a part of the business. It is not the business. And often business owners confuse that and they think the work, the operations, the day-to-day -day activities are the business. They're not. That's that's a part of the business. The business needs to focus on where's revenue going to be generated from, not only today, but two years from now. Where is 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 the business going to become a household name in the industry that it's in? That is the business. That is the focus on the business. What um, partnerships do I have to form for my business, not only to remain strong, but to grow? And again, growing the business is growing the value of the business, uh, not the work. You may be able to grow the value of the business without adding additional work because your name brand becomes value, correct? And yeah, so... Yeah. Some companies don't do anything. <laughs> Let's take, you know, Bitcoin. <laughs> what do they do? The operation is really on the popularity of, of the business. And it really is not physically building anything, right? That's just an example of businesses yeah. that are creating wealth based on the brand 
and 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 the business and not really the operations okay so so carl here's here's what i'm hearing all right we've now decided we want to build this and we're going to put down the wrench now if if i'm the plumber and i'm saying all right you got me you got me sir i i want that's what i want to do i i understand that i'm going to have to create revenue i'm going to have to do this thing called branding and i don't understand that either and i got to create some partnerships but what can i start doing to be able to scale that i i understand that i've got expertise now now how do i start obviously what you're telling me carl is to start bringing in other plumbers like myself to actually do the work and i'm supposed to find the uh deals is that what you're saying yes that's part of it uh, yeah, give me so a give there, me a step by step because yeah just let's make this the uh the dummies guide for uh for scaling a business all right so scaling comes at a, at a second or third step right scaling okay. is not the first step Okay. You, once you decide to put the wrench down uh, as, yeah. as you know, utilizing the plumber example, the, the plumber business owner now, because he's no longer a plumber, the business owner now, first and foremost, step one is focusing on gaining new contracts, right? And we talked about how you do that is by removing your geographic fencing. So as a business owner, your first step is to realize, okay, in order to create a large company, I have to have a large footprint. So my geographic fencing has to grow. I cannot be a local um, operation. I have to be a, a bigger operation because it's going to give me more opportunity to generate contracts. So focus one is on gaining the work, getting the work, signing the contracts, whether you have the manpower or not. So if I am in South Florida, and I have found a large contract with a state, a city, or or a private company uh, that is outside <clears throat> of South Florida, but I have the qualifications to bid on it or, or pursue that opportunity, then I'm gonna go pursue that opportunity. And even though I don't have the manpower to do that work there yet, it's not going to stop me. My goal, step one, is to bring in the contracts get the contracts uh that you know you have the expertise to manage personnel who are going to do the work right not right. the expertise to do the work so do not drown yourself as a business owner saying oh my god if i get this you know five million dollar contract that requires for me to have 50 plumbers on staff how am i going to do it how am i no get the contract Focus on getting the contract. Focus yeah. on the requirements of getting that contract and and understanding what that is. And of course, don't go get the biggest contract where the requirements are beyond your financial capability, but do get a contract that's beyond your current capability and understand that you will get there, right? So if I'm used to doing $5,000, $10,000 jobs as an individual plumber, and I have an opportunity for a contract that's $100,000, okay, that is within reach. Don't go for the $5 million contract when you're only used to doing $5,000 jobs, but you can go to a $100,000 contract. So, you know, rule of thumb is, is probably 10, 20 times the value of your current work. You can pursue that, right? And, and, and so the con step one is to start to bring in some contracts wherever you've expanded your geographic boundaries to, correct? And you've got to do a lot of legwork, a lot of research, get online, get on these bid sites that, that the bids come up, given your, your specific uh, expertise right. so that right. you're not cold calling, but you know, you've got to get, get on bid sites, government bids, private bid sites, sites that provide you daily notifications of opportunities that are coming that you can participate on. And you may not be able to participate on a prime contract as a prime. When we started, a lot of times we would have to be the sub to a prime, right? So the prime got the big contract because that encompassed um, a lot of different steps, but you got the plumbing side. So 
you reach out to the primes that are bidding this and you let them know that, hey, mm -hmm. I can be a sub for you because I can handle that piece, the plumbing side. Let's say they're building, you know, 10 high rises. And of course, you don't do anything with the high rise, but you do the plumbing. Say, hey, I can participate on the plumbing. Right. Yeah. So basically so you're like, saying. Sorry. So basically what you're saying is yeah. any area that you're in, whether it's plumbing, whether it's electrical, whether it's uh, telecommunications, whatever it is. If you're not in a position to move up to to get into that bidding, start reaching out to those those prime uh, prime companies and uh, look to get in as a sub for them. Yes, a, some type of subcontractor for them, so that now you're going from uh, ten thousand dollar contracts to a hundred thousand dollar contracts. Exactly, and, and because you've removed your geofencing you're able to go and find the jobs with these companies that they don't want to do themselves or don't have the manpower to do themselves. Most primes, most primes are going to sub out every aspect of the work. Got it. Okay. The only thing they yeah. do is get the contract. It's exactly what I'm talking about, yeah. but they do it at a higher scale because they, they're, they've already reached the other, you know, the, the higher levels. Yeah. And, and they've gotten so, the war uh, test. Right. And so yeah. they're going to sub it out. And why not to you? Why not to you? My biggest okay. advice to the business owner is never think you can't do it because you're too small. There's no such thing as, as too small. Um, you, you always have to think that I can do this. I can do this contract. I can gain the work. And again, prime contracts usually encompass many different parts of a project. You focus on your piece. Uh, primes are going to sub it all out. They're going to bid this. And, and then you have to create for yourself a, um, you know, a, uh, a, uh, your, your resume, your company resume that, uh, that tells the prime who you are, what you do, what your expertise are, your minority statuses, if you have them, right. The things that they can use to win the contract, right. How do how do hiring you benefit the prime? And that's how you, you know, so a lot of times we will use our minority status and go to a prime and say, hey, you can get that 20% prime piece. I mean, that 20% um, minority status if you hire us under you, right? Yeah. So the prime yeah, may not be a minority, but by hiring yeah. you, they meet that requirement. So what you're doing is you're, adding value before they've even right like exactly. you're adding value to them before they've even won the bid before you've gotten even talking about getting money for yourself you've already added value right off the get-go exactly uh, absolutely Amazing. you you have to find you it's what can i do for you mr prime yeah, um, yeah, now, what can you do for me and the approach to the business owners please never approach a prime by asking uh, to help you for to get the work, um, it, it is a it is a, f a fact of life that when you approach any any entity with what benefits them by hiring you has more success than by you asking them to help you out with mm -hmm. you know taking a chance on you. When you say, hey, take a chance on me, uh, you know, I'm just starting out. The first thing they say is this guy's not going to make it. But if you go to a prime company and you say, hey, you need to hire me because I am going to meet your minority, your 20 percent. So you're going to gain that contract. You're going to gain 20 percent advantage on the competition. You need to hire me because we deliver better than anybody else. You need to hire me. You know, you always start with you need to hire me, not would you hire me, right? That, 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 okay. We never ask, would you hire me or would you give me a chance? No, we always say these are the reasons why you are better off hiring me instead of the competition. Mm -hmm. Okay. That approach must yeah. happen. So you come in, you approach the, these primes, you get the, this is your, your next step up. So to getting those additional leads the additional contracts and and now is from what you're saying are these what you would consider partnerships or 
or with regards to the branding and partnerships? Is there still another level that uh, that we have to do? These are the initial partnerships, right? So the initial yeah. partnerships are always as a subcontractor or whatnot. But but yeah. let me, you know, so that people understand this applies to anything. Let's say in the real estate, I, I think you guys do yeah. some real estate. Come right? on, let's talk real estate. In yep. the real estate, if you're a realtor just starting out and you go to a to a homeowner or a or a, a seller or a brokerage firm and you say, Hey, um, you know, I'm starting out and I could use the help and I'll work really hard for you because I'm new at it. No, maybe you get 50, 50, but if you go to the brokerage firm or you go to the seller and you say, look, this is why you need me on your team or Mr. Seller, this is why you need me to be your realtor. You need me to list your property because if you don't do it with me, you're going to be wasting time. You're going to be wasting money. Why? Because I am good at this, but you've got to sound confident. Even if it's your first time, as a business owner, you've got to sound confident. You cannot sound afraid uh, like a rookie. You've got to really believe in, believe in you. You know, it starts there. If I'm a realtor and I'm coming to, to, to get a listing and I'm, I'm just starting out, I'm not going to sound like I'm starting out. I am coming to you, the, the seller, and saying, if you don't list with me, you're wasting time, you're wasting money. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Now, is that 100% guaranteed? No, but it's a better approach than saying, hey, I'm starting out and I would appreciate you giving me the opportunity. That doesn't right. work. Right. You have probably a 30% chance of getting the business that way and you have a 70 to 80% chance of getting the business if you sound confident and say, without me, you will waste money. You will waste time. Without me, you're going to miss out on this, this, uh, this group of potential buyers. Why? Because I can get that for you. You mm -hmm. get it? Yeah. The, yeah. The, the seller wants to do business with a confident person. They don't want to do business with someone who's right. just starting out. Right. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And and obviously those aren't the exact words that you have to use. You have to be authentic to who you are, but you got to right. step in there with confidence and know that you're going to be able to bring value to that person, which is why you're there in the first place, what you started with. And uh and so you can make that that bold claim of this is what I'm going to do for you. So you need to hire me. And again, you need to bring me that business. I want to be clear. I'm not saying lie about your experience. <laughs> right. What right. Yeah. Is be confident not about your authentic. ability. It's yeah. not about lying about your experience, but express the confidence in your ability to deliver. Right. People right. will 99% of the time, do business with you because of your confident personality more than your experience. Because believe it or not, an experienced individual who is very shy and, and not confident will not gain the same results as a confident individual who is going to go and try and get it, even though they may have more experience. The end result is usually in favor of the confident individual. Um, and again, you know, this may not apply in all scenarios. I guess if you're building a rocket, you want the expert, not the confidence, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but in general business terms, um, confidence. And again, usually the business owner, which is a subject of our conversation, the business owner is an expert in their industry. Yeah, They're, they're not a rookie, uh, but you've got to be confident when you're dealing with a larger size contract. What yeah. I'm trying to relay here is if you're used to doing $5,000 jobs and now you're bidding on a $100,000 job, do it with the same confidence that you approach a $5,000 job. Don't be yeah. afraid of it. That's the point. So now how do I, okay, I get the bid. I, I get the, the sub work. Now, how do I get that job done now? Um, I don't have a team. I don't have anybody with me. I put the wrench down. I got this contract. Now, what do I do? Now you say, oh, crap, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've been hired. And, and I said I was going deliver. Thing. Now I got to deliver. All right. And, and so, again, focus, right? Okay. You say, okay, I've got this contract. What are the requirements? Okay, these are the requirements, A, B, C, D, E. You've got to understand the requirements. Okay, let's find a, a group that 
has the capabilities and usually they are a bigger company than yours right mm -hmm. but they don't have the contract you have the contract so it doesn't matter it doesn't matter so you're gonna find a company that has the the physical capabilities to deliver on the contract you just been awarded okay and that's where you have to learn to negotiate from a position of power, but understanding that most of the time, the company you're hiring, most of the times, sorry, the company that you're hiring, is gonna be a bigger company than yours, yeah. right? But again, confidence. I have the contract, I have the business. So I am going to approach these folks and say, hey, listen, you, you probably don't know me. I have this very good contract and I wanna award it to you, okay? As long as you meet all the qualifications, right? You got to sound like you're bigger than they are. Um, and I'm going to give you favorable terms because you don't know me. What is favorable terms? I'm going to give you favorable terms on payments, meaning I'm going to pay you sooner. So you're probably used to getting paid in 30, 60, 90 days. I'll pay you in 21 days. Correct. And we'll talk about how you make that happen. Okay. Um, so favorable payment terms is going to give confidence to a company that's larger than yours that you're approaching. Um, remember, they don't know you. They yeah. don't know you, don't do their homework, and but they really don't know your size as a company, right? They, they may right. assume you're smaller, but favorable terms is gonna be attractive to the subcontractor that's gonna do the work. So you've gotta do that, and we'll talk about how you make that happen. Um, and great prices. You cannot, you cannot make the same margins that you did when you were doing the five thousand dollar job for Joe at his house, sticking with the plumber, as you are when you're doing a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollar project, and that you're hiring a a company to do the work. You are going to have to give up most of your profit. But understand, the hundred thousand dollar job. That gives you twenty thousand. You know that you take twenty percent on. It's going to give you twenty thousand dollars versus the five thousand dollar job that you took fifty, sixty percent on would only give you twenty five hundred, three thousand dollars. You get it? Yeah. So twenty percent of a hundred thousand dollar job is a lot more money than fifty and sixty percent of a five thousand dollar job, and you need to understand yeah. that. So, yeah. So yeah, you're going to offer better terms, and you are going to give them better rates you are going to take the lesser rate because you're not a known entity yet. Right. Um, and so those are the first things that you're gonna do. So identify yeah. the, the company that can do the work in the geographic area that you've won the contract, yeah. uh, provide them favorable payment terms and provide them a, a pricing usually higher than they're used to getting, right? Yeah. Which means less profit for you, but you're building your business. You are not going to get rich on the first on the first job. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. L let me ask you this question: How do I know, uh, as I'm now trying to build a business, and and we could take any industry, and you're saying, okay, I'm going to get I'm going to get that contract, or I'm going to get that deal, and now I'm going to get someone else to do it. But the question is, how do I know that I'm going to be able to price that? deal properly so that I'm able to make that 20% um, when I when I give it out and when I give it out how do I know that these guys are going to be able to do the job correctly because if it's not done properly I'm the one on the hook right yes but there's risk to everything right right um, is there is there a way to mitigate this? Look, can, come on, can we get some less risk in here as we're as we're scaling here? Absolutely. Okay. So, but let's start before we talk about risk. Let's talk about pricing. How do I price yeah. this job? Yeah. Um, I've never usually, done a hundred thousand dollar job, right? Right. Usually, what we do we do a lot less of it now because we're a larger firm today. But right. when we were smaller. What we would do is we would take that contract, right? And I would send the details of the work and the pricing sheet without the information on the bid to those companies that can do the work and ask them to price it for me. Hey, I've got this opportunity, even though I haven't won it yet, 
Yeah. I got this opportunity. Right. Price this out for me. Give me your pricing. Send it to three or four different firms, right? I do have to do the legwork behind the scenes and 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 do the research, make sure that they're a reputable company that are right. they're gonna deliver, right? Because that was the other question you had. Yeah. But you send them the the pricing sheets. Um, if if this is a construction type work, but if you're doing anything else, it's the same thing. I'm I'm bidding on a project. I know the price points, whatever that project yeah. is, even if I'm bidding on a real estate purchase. Um I'm going to find out what I can get if I'm doing real estate, what I can get Absolutely. for this. Absolutely. In real right? estate, when we're doing this in real estate, we're we're actually going to go look at a property and then we're when we get it under contract, we're gonna go bring in two or three subs. You're gonna bring in some contract yeah, some uh carpenters, some general contractors, right? Get them to come in there. Hey, what would you charge to do this? And and they're gonna tell you what they're looking at. You get you got three quotes, you can see it, you're gonna come back and you're gonna say, Hey, Mr. Seller, here's what here's what I can do. Or you exactly. can always come back and turn around and say, Hey, Mr. Seller, uh, look, this is what it's gonna cost to do this. I'm gonna have to lower my offer as well, right? There's there's uh, always room for negotiation in that. But now what you're talking about is being able to get someone else who's experienced in that side to be able to come in and give you your pricing so you don't have to uh, know it all right up front. You just had the cojones to be able to go out and get that that deal. That's right. That's so right. And, and in, in some cases, it may be that all the pricing you get back it's higher than than the bid is, you know, the, these jobs are going for. And you go back to these guys and that's where the salesman comes in. You say, listen, I need you to lower your prices. This is a large opportunity and, and you need to work with me. And you tell that to all of them, right? The three or four yeah. subs need you to lower your prices and you explain why the opportunity is so good and why it's in their best interest to, to do so. So right. that you can create that 20% margin for yourself. And again, I use 20% as an example. It may be 15, it may be 25, uh, maybe even 30, depending on the opportunity. But the point is, that's how you, at the beginning, find the right pricing. Now, also remember, you're an expert in what you're, you're the business that you're pursuing. So you also know what the industry rates are. And so you may not need to get pricing from somebody else because you know the rates and you know what the, the, the going, uh, the ceiling is and the bottom is on those. So remember, you're an expert in your industry. You're just not a large company. Right. And so right. You, so now you, I've gotten the So now I've gotten the bid. I've gone out and gotten uh, estimates from, from subs. So I know what it's going to cost um, on top of that. And I, I probably had some idea beforehand because I was able to reach out to them in advance uh, and start building those relationships. And so now I've got the contract. I've got the uh, I've got them coming in. I kind of checked them out so I know they're reputable so I can, for the most part, trust that the work is going to be done. And now I'm I've got them doing that work on my behalf. So now right. how am I? How am I getting my brand built so that I'm getting the next deal? Or do I have to just keep looking? Is part of my job to keep looking for the next deal? So take it a step back. Yes, it is part of your it is part of your job as a business owner and business grower to yeah. keep looking for the next deal because that's what you're in now. You're in the business of finding business, not in the business of doing work, right? Yeah. Um, in the industry that you're in. But before you hand off the work, you've got to prepare your processes and procedures in writing for the step-by-step -step, uh, process of the work, the how do you supervise the work, and how do you get your name brand out there, right? So mm -hmm. you always want to make sure that your subcontractors are working as you, and, you know, and that's part of your contract. So... It could be ABC company representing, you know, Corel's company, right? Yeah. Or it can, or you can demand that all their equipment and vehicles and man uh, manpower refer to themselves while on your project as Corel's company. 
and not as anything else, right? So you may have, you may put that on your agreement with yourselves and say, well, working for me, you are Corel's company. You are not your company, right? Okay. Uh, or if you, you know, if, if that's tough and, and you don't have the leverage, you may say, okay, you're working as ABC company representing Corel's company, but Corel's company name must be known to whoever you're doing the work for out in the field, your name must be out there because that's how you build a name brand. Your processes and procedures, you must design them based on your experience. When I was working the job, when I had the ranch, what were the steps that I took to do a quality product? Okay, that's what I'm going to expect from the people I hire. You are going to do your work the same way I did the work when I was a laborer, when I was a, a, a self-employed individual. Right. That's what I call the business owner who has the wrench, self-employed. It's the worst place to be. Um, and so you you say, hey, this is how I did it. This is, was a quality product. My customers loved it. I am going to have my vendors do it my way. And so you put it in writing and you say, hey, part of the deal, you work in this format. This is the first step, step two, step three. Right. And then you must invest in someone to inspect what you expect. That's an old saying, Inspec inspect what you expect, right? And again, I know we're focusing on the plumber example, but this applies in anything. If I am a law firm and I'm adding different law firms, I want to grow my business. It's the same thing. How did my law firm work? And, in, in, you know, how did I like to run my law firm? That's how I want all my other law firms to run. And your process and procedures are written based on how you like the business to run. And that's how you run your company because you were successful as the plumber, as the individual, you did a quality job, you just couldn't scale up, right? But the quality of the work, you can replicate that no matter how many vendors you have and no matter what line of, of work it is, you write it, you put that process in place based on the way you like, you ran your business, and you demand that from your from your vendors. It is key for you as a business owner to have in place the guidelines and the rules that your people will follow. You can't right. just tell them. It has to be in writing. It has to be signed on. So I, I think something important to say here is for those of us, uh, for those of you that are listening, is to understand that there's there's obviously some work that you're going to have to do here to be able to scale up. You're going to have to identify some of these things that are important to you in a project. In whatever area of business you're you're in, I think what uh, what you're pointing to there, Carell, is like um, if you're if you're into plumbing, you know you may have to write out a list of the things that are important right you're saying you got to be able to inspect what you expect you've got to be able to convey to that other company in writing literally uh for it to be enforceable you've got to be able to put something in writing for them to even agree to and uh and if that's too hard a step then you probably shouldn't be doing that uh yeah you have you to move on to the next that, right? Yeah, you must you move might. on to the next vendor. A absolutely. Yeah. Look, right. processes and procedures, you must invest the time to write them. Uh, yeah. And you have the experience. You you say, how would I do it? That's how I'm going to put it on paper. That's how I want it done. Yeah. Also, non-compete yeah. clauses in your contract. No matter what business you're in, you don't want your sub to take your customer. So you have to have strong non-compete clauses that do not allow your vendors or the, the folks you're hiring in any line of work to take your customer. So non-compete, very important, processes and procedures. Processes and procedures first, non-compete second, okay? And then insurance, liability, right? Mitigate liability. You must pass that liability on to the people who are actually doing the work. And so therefore, your, your, you must have insurance that pushes that liability onto the individuals who are actually doing the work because you're not doing it anymore. So you must yeah. have strong insurance requirements as well in, in your business. Again, doesn't matter what business you're in, liability must be passed on to the individuals who are doing the work. You yeah. will always have liability, 
But like you, like you said, Neil, you want to mitigate, reduce that liability right. by having strong insurance policy requirements in place of the folks who are doing whatever it is that they're doing for you. Yeah. Well, look, I've got a situation right now where a one of my partners was was working on a deal with uh, with a realtor. Actually, no, I've got two two partners that were working on deals with realtors, and the realtors you know, put, did a contract, did this contract to purchase, uh, for purchase and sale. And then one of them on, on one of the deals forgot to send to my, my friend, my partner, the, um, you know, a, a release document, you know, a document saying that, okay, we're clear of this deal. We're going to, we're going to move yeah. on. They decided they weren't going to buy it. And, uh, and then in the other one, the the realtor in in doing a negotiation i don't, this is interesting in both of these in this one they they changed some of the wording for uh for a change in in that contract and in both situations when i ended up talking to these individuals and they were and they were saying hey i'm stuck what do i do I said well that's their job right if you've asked in the one, if you've asked them to do X and they changed it, then that's on them. Mm -hmm. Now, and that, and, and here's the importance of the two. In the other one, it's their job to come back to you and say, hey, um, I need, we, we need to get a release document signed to move on from the transaction. Yeah, that's absolutely. Literally why you bring them in. Now, the, here's, the, here's a, a real difference between the two that I think is important is on the one that that person um, did not produce that document. And so, you know, however many days later, they're having to do that and they're having to hey, deal with them. Neil, but on the other side, yes. Can I pause you for a second? I'm sorry, yeah. but uh, I've got to plug in. Yeah, I got to plug in. One second, please. Excuse me. Sorry, I'm back. Apologize. No uh, okay, so we were just saying with regards to the other contract, what happened was they made that change in the in the contract and adding in some of their own words. But oh. they got my friend, my partner, they actually signed it off. And so what <laughs> was interesting about the two was uh, because both of them let something slip. And, right. and I think that was important, right? They didn't inspect what they expected. I love yeah, exactly. your point, right? They That's didn't right. inspect. But the difference is, and you're passing on liability, but the difference is, is in the second situation, the the realtor sent it back to the, the investor and the investor signed it off without checking to make sure that it was the actual words that they wanted. And, uh, and so you know, in that situation, I said, you can never, when you're at that level, you can never just pass it off, just sign a yeah. document because now you've just taken back on that liability. So that liability I, I like what you're yours. talking about. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and as business owners, remember, we're no longer uh, self-employed at this point. We're no longer a small business owner now uh, or a plumber. We are now a business owner dealing with other companies that have their own laws and regulations and lawyers. Um, and you have to make sure that you're being a professional now, not a professional plumber, but a professional business person. And that means your documents that you put out have to be accurate and clear. And, and the documents that you receive, you must read and, and be clear with as well. And, and absolutely, liability is the most important thing. Um, in any business is yeah. making sure that you reduce the liability to yourself, to your company. Remember, you don't wanna be in business and have a claim that puts you out of business. And so most important thing is that um, there's a lot of small business owners out there who 
you know, have claims filed against them. They, they close up shop, start the company under a new name and just live their life that way. You'll never have a real business that way. You'll just be what it is, a, a, a mess. If you decide to be to become a real company and to really grow your business, then, then you must behave as a professional. And professionals cross their T's and dot their I's. They do not leave anything to chance, do not leave anything to risk. And at the beginning, you can't have the expensive lawyers and all that, but you must have someone with legal experience to guide you through those, those legal documents that you're putting together. Um, and, and then you grow from, from there and, and, and grow your business, but, uh, you must remain a professional. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love what you're talking about here and, and I love the step-by-step -step nature to it because when you put down that wrench to be able to, and here's what I'm hearing to be able to focus on that growth. Now <coughs> you have to be able to put down that wrench and now you're removing those geofences right? You're willing to go into different areas, which probably helps you because now you can't go do the work because it's perhaps a little bit further out, but now <laughs> you're, you're able to, okay, I, I can get the hundred thousand dollar contract, but I can't get the million dollar contract. So, so you go to uh, a larger companies and you get a piece right. of that work and then you're able to then spread out and get other companies to bid on that work that we right. didn't get that business in the first place. And all the way along, you're creating friendships, you're creating partnerships, you're people that you want to do business with, and you're creating the opportunity for opportunities down the road. And, and the whole while, you have in your mind that uh, you know, you've got to protect yourself from liability. You have to have some insurance in place and be accountable for uh, who you are and the whole way along you're branding yourself that that's what I got out of what what you're sharing yeah no, no absolutely and, and any and just, any steps that we missed in there no no uh, so far no but yeah. you know what's funny is in everything that you described that plumber has no longer said anything about plumbing there's no <laughs> longer a conversation about plumbing it's a conversation about building your vendor base so yeah. as, as you make relationships with these subcontractors uh, that are going to do whatever work it is that, that you got the contract for, as, as you meet more, your pool of people who can do the work that you're in, the line of work that you're in, grows. So your ability to deliver grows. Your ability to create competition you know, amongst your vendors, right? Um, so that you can increase your profits, that grows. So as, as you, you, know, you develop, it's, it's, it's a snowball effect in a positive direction because if now I've got two or three vendors that I've hired and, and I paid them on time and we still have to talk about how you do that. Um, and now they have confidence in me. The next project that I bring, they all want it, right? Because I'm a good mm -hmm. customer. And so now you tell them, hey, if you want the contract, you need to improve on your price. And so you increase your profitability. So now your business is starting to improve on profit. Your ability to produce more work is increasing. Your customers are now gaining confidence. Your name brand is, is getting out. So your business starts to grow. Now you got to start adding the staff, right? And, and again, you have to have the right staff in place. You cannot do eight hours of work in one day you know, more than eight hours by yourself. We talked about that. So if you have the right staff, you'll be able to manage. You need an accounting team. And, and the accounting team may be one person at the beginning. And yeah. eventually you grow and you need supervisors, right? Because you've got to supervise the work. And so you may have to hire a supervisor that lives in another city. And, yeah. and they work from home, but they work for you. That's a, that's a staff person. And that gets uh, calculated into your profit. But they're going to be your eyes out there because where are your eyes? Your eyes are on the next contract. I got yeah. this contract. Now my supervisor is going to make sure they do the work based on the on the on the um, on the processes and procedures that I put in place, and so on and so on. And again, if if it's a law firm, you know, because I don't want people to think on 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 this podcast that we're only talking about 
construction or, or anything like that. If you're a law firm and you open another firm, you got to have a person there that manages that office based on your directives, right? So they are an extension of you. And so you hire that person and they run that law firm in the manner that you would like that law firm to run. And so they're your eyes and ears. So you have to invest in the people. And as your business grows, you're quickly going to have to invest in an accounting team in your office, not accountants that do your taxes, people who run your books in your office, or you'll quickly find yourself uh, growing out, you know, like your business will outpace your abilities because yeah. there's too much business coming in. And so you have to make sure that 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 you do all that. Uh, so now on to where do I get the money to pay the people, right? Because my customer is going to pay me in 60 and 90 days. And I just told my vendor, I'm going to pay him in 21 days. Well, where am I going to get the money? Because it can't come for me. I, I don't have the money. I just started. Well, I'm a plumber. I can barely afford the van that I drive. <laughs> you know. But there are entities out there, uh, firms that lend money. and They are expensive. But remember, you're starting out and beggars can be choosers. Mm -hmm. There are firms out there that lend money based on the project that you have the land money based on billing. And so you have no choice but to bite the bullet and go with these firms, these lenders that are a higher interest rate. Uh, most of them are called factoring firms and they factor. So you, you bill your customer, you send a copy of that bill to those firms. They advance you in two to three days. Okay, about 90%, usually 80 to 90% of your invoice and you use that money to pay your vendors. And so that's how you bankroll your operations initially. That's just one example. There's other, there's mm -hmm. other, yes, they're all expensive. I understand that. But again, if you're trying to grow your business and you don't have the capital behind you to do so, you are going to have to partner up with one of these financial firms that lands on invoices that lands on projects, right? And doesn't yeah. land on, you can't go to a regular bank and say, hey, bank, Mr. Banker, give me $5 million to go run a business that has no, no financials to support it. You mm -hmm. can't do that. Uh, and yeah. so, no, you're not going to get prime plus one or two or 3% interest rate. You're going to have to pay higher rates or right. bring in an investor who's going to take X percentage of your business. You don't want that. You're yeah. going to you want to remain 100% owner. So I much rather pay a higher interest rate and keep ownership of my business than bring in an investor who is going to take 20, 30, 40, 50%. And, you know, if they're putting a lot of money, they're going to take controlling interest. And then you lost control of your business. Don't right. do that. Pay the higher interest rates. Create uh, cash. Keep the equity for yourself. Exactly. And when, yeah. you, uh, when you build up the equity, then you start phasing out those those high interest rate uh, lenders who give you money, but you're in control. Let, let me ask you this, Carol. Now, I, thank you for, for sharing that process. And as you've built, you know, and this is not just theoretical, this is what you've done. So what was the hardest part for you as we're, we're getting close to finishing up here? I just want to hear what was the hardest part through there for you to navigate for you to transition through uh, what was the the most difficult part for you the most difficult part neil uh, and, and i'm glad you asked that question people would think it was getting the business or getting the money no the hardest part is adding the staff fast enough to help and support the growth of your business believe me business owners and i'm talking to all you small business owners out there you follow this process, your business is going to grow. The hardest part is hiring the staff fast enough to keep up with the growth of your business. And, and no, you're not going to grow to $100 million, right? Or, or you may, who knows? But those first 15 and $20 million, they will come like that. They, they will come like that in your business. And you need the staff because a one-person shop cannot run a $15 million company, Okay. You need accounting, you need HR, you need all, all of that back office support, okay, that is going to keep your business in line. So the hardest part, Neil, was 
getting the staff in place because I was so focused on growing the business and, and, and bringing the business in and dealing with the vendors that the staff became second or third uh, important. And that was a mistake because we were quickly over $30 million in three years time and we didn't have the staff to support it, right? And so we, we had to then slow down and, and add the staff and, and get the corporation to the level they had grown before we could continue to grow the next level, which is what we did. And then, of course, we continued on growing. Um, but that was the hardest part. Wow. It's interesting because that's also the scariest part, right? Up until that point, you can you know, as an entrepreneur, as a self-employed, you know, you, you can, and even as a business owner, you n learn to rely on yourself and get things done. Now, the moment you get into that space of hiring staff, you're now getting into this world of where you have to be comfortable with staff taking on these different pieces. And, uh, you've always been the guy that, um, gets to inspect what you expect so yeah <laughs> you know and now now you're talking about being able to step away from that and i know a lot of business owners that don't have that ability they don't know how to let someone else handle so that piece. let me give you the formula you're absolutely right by the way here's the formula you know those process and procedures for your vendors to do the work yep. right okay when you hire on let's say an, an accounting person to help you with your books. You've been doing the books, right? You say, okay, first of all, you hire someone who's got the qualifications via their resume, that's all fine and dandy, but now you give them the process and procedure for their job. Hey, this is how I ran my books. This is how I want them ran. These are the guidelines. I want you to do it that way. And now you're, you're trusting, but you've given them direction. And then it's much easier to uh, inspect your directions that you put in place than to just hire somebody to do a job without written directions, without process and procedures, right? Because then you don't know where they're failing. But if you give them step one, step two, and step three based on how you were running it, right? The same thing you did with your vendor. You, rep you repeat this with your staff. Okay, I was doing my books this way. These are the steps I took. Here they are in writing. This is how I want to follow. When they fail, you know what step they failed at. And so you have then the opportunity to help them fix it. Or if you can't fix it and they continue to do it, then replace them. But you know where the problem lied. And with the next person, you'll also know where the problem lies. And, and you know, every individual is different. It may be that there's no problem. But the process and procedure for each individual employee happens. So you hire them and now they become a copy of you on your books because this is how you did your books. Okay. Now you're going to hire someone to handle the, the staff, an HR person, right? Cause you're hiring supervisors. Okay. This is how I did this and this is how I'll do it. Now it may be that they come in and say, listen, I'm an experienced HR person or I'm an experienced accounting person. I think that you can improve by doing this. Okay. Well, we'll change that process to this guy, but you have the guideline written. Yeah. And so the individuals, as you hire them, they are an extension of you till they become a trusted individual where then they replicate that. And so as they hire people, they follow the same process. Yeah. And it becomes a positive domino effect where everybody's replicating your initial process. And today, for example, with me, you know, I don't, I don't do anything in HR. I don't do anything in accounting. Uh, but the process, if you go back to the basics, it's how I ran it. It's just, it's become as, you know, I have accountants now on staff that are a lot more knowledgeable because I don't know anything. They are a lot more knowledgeable than me. Um, but they follow the basic principles that I like my business to run on, right? Yeah. And, and so that's, that's all you do. You replicate it and don't fear the, the hiring of people because if you have a proper process in place, you're going to find out fairly quickly if that individual is good or not. And you just replace them, but you never yeah. shy. You never move away from your model of having the staff in place to to help you run your growing business. Never yeah. move away from the model.
And that right there is leadership to wealth. I, I love how you you broke that down because it, you before you can get, everyone thinks when you say the word leadership, that everyone thinks it's about leading other people. And I you just broke it down beautifully right from you, the, you know, our example of the plumber, plumber. <laughs> right from the plumber doing the work to he has to take some control, some responsibility, some leadership over himself and each step along the way. And, uh, and each step along the way, you really broke down so that we can understand they're, they're clear, they're basic, but there is something for you to own something for you to take responsibility for and then and move along right all the way on up till the point that now you can start replicating yourself with staff and uh, and you're still now you're at this point where you're able to uh, pass on to them how I'm you sure. like things done all of this stuff and they're able to to replicate that out and you can continue to uh, to lead all of your staff, all of the people that uh, work for you, that you're giving opportunity to, that you're putting money in their pockets in one way, shape, or form. And uh, you're you're a totally different person from the guy that was actually uh, turning the wrench. Once Absolutely. But real quick, and I know we've got to go, Neil, but, but real quick, we are over 500 people strong on our team today. Yeah. Right? Never in my wildest dream did I imagine I'd have a company that has – so many plus our subcontractors, right? Which are yeah. uh, a bunch of vendors, 50 plus companies that do work for us, right? But I only manage directly one individual. Wow. Well, actually two, my CFO and my COO. Those are the yeah. people I manage, only two, right? And they manage two or three and so on and so on and so on. And, and so uh, the message here to the small business owner is, you don't have to manage 500 people. You only have to manage the people that follow your directive and pass it on and they manage a few and, and so on and so on. Yeah. So the model works, correct? And if I did it, then you, uh, small business owner, Mr. Plumber or Mrs. Plumber, <laughs> uh, you can also do it. Yeah. It's uh, discipline dedication, determination, and the desire to get it done. And you will, you will make it happen. And there are a lot of opportunities out there for us, small business owners to really uh, get it done and, and, and make our, you know, our dream happen. Yeah, I did it. Crow. So tell me if, if people want to uh, connect with you, how can they do that? How can people connect with you? Well, you can reach me through LinkedIn, you know, Corel Gomez uh, on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. Or, you know, if you want to email me directly, uh, kgomez at draftpros.com. Um, I'm here to, to provide advice. I, I don't charge for this, so I'm not selling anything. I just, I'm an advocate for small business owners yeah. who want to grow their business. What I ask is, please, if you reach out to me, have the passion that it takes to want to grow your business. I, I, I don't want to waste your time or mine with people who really just don't want to grow and they're just looking for questions. Oh, well, how do I finance? No, that, that's not. I want to talk to passionate people, people who are passionate about growing their business, whatever it is, people who really want to really make something better of themselves than they were 10 years ago and, and be better 10 years from that, right? Just continue to grow as an individual, as, as, a, as a business owner, as a corporate person. Um, I want to talk to people who are passionate about their growth as an individual and as a, as a business owner. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you have uh, an Instagram or uh, TikTok account? I, I do not. I do not, Neil. I, I really don't do a lot of social media. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I have to get into it and maybe I'll reach out to you offline and ask about it. But I am so dumb when it comes to social media. You have no idea. I don't have Instagram or, or I don't even know how to use TikTok. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> we, we have to, uh, we'll have to connect. It's a great opportunity, my man, for you to be able to, for people to be able to hear your message. Um, even for, for just from a business 
standpoint and branding standpoint, I I love to talk to people about it because there is there are ways to be. I I actually have people calling me oftentimes with uh, opportunities and deals just because they know I'm in the space. They get to know me. They get they get that authenticity that especially when they pick up the phone and they call me. Right. And, and I think one of the things for you would be, is that people will get the genuineness of one, this guy that wants to add value and uh, you know, that they can get to know, like, and trust. And, uh, and all of a sudden they want to do business with you. And uh, who knows, it might be, uh, it, it could be any one of a number of things might not even be draft pros. They might be saying, Carl, Carl, can you come uh, speak? at yeah. uh, at my event right so i've done that you know for the sba office the uh, usdot um small business administration office i've done yeah. public speak speaking engagements all over the country um and it's all been uh, an email or a call hey can you come speak to small business owners i love to do that I, listen yeah. i just want i just want the small business owner to know that they can do it because i did it and if i can do it Anyone can do this. Okay. It. Just passion. I keep saying passion. You got to have it. So guys, if you want more of uh, Carrell Gomez, uh, you can go f hit him up on LinkedIn and, uh, and follow him there. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, work with him to, to get a, uh, a TikTok or uh, an Instagram account. <laughs> but uh, Carol, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, you know, sharing just a wealth of knowledge you know, that, that unless you've gone through it, you know, you can't know all of those steps and uh, really appreciate Absolutely. you being able to do that, especially coming from where you've come from, from uh, your family has come from to being able to put in the work, know what that takes on the ground level, and then uh, to build up. I uh, really appreciate you sharing with us today. Neil, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Our first conversation. And then today, always fun um yeah. you you ask great questions uh, and i i love your show i'm gonna follow you now uh on, on every podcast that you put out uh you're a lot of fun thank you Thanks. thank you for inviting me and and for allowing me to share some of my experiences with you and 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 with your audience oh thank you very much we we loved having you today and uh guys uh please make sure you go uh like and follow this episode when uh, it comes out and go follow uh, Carell and we will see you guys next time on the Thank leadership you. to wealth podcast.